He's been here before. I won't go into introducing you, but he will be speaking on again on Phineas Quimby. Some writings of Phineas Quimby introduce some philosophies on reincarnation for there, and also some little gratitude, of course. So, Dr. Edward Berlbaugh. Thank you so much. Well, good morning. This is just a test. I want to touch this <laughs> lazy pointer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Something came up. Huh? <laughs> ah. Well, if you were, some of you were here uh, the last time I spoke, uh, and I spoke about the healing side of Phineas Parker's Quimby, and I talked a little bit about the. Uh, family tree, if you will, of New Thought, and uh, Quimby is said to be the father of New Thought in the New World, in the United States, or America, whatever. So just, I'm going to just quickly touch on a couple of things there. He was born in 1802, and from 1847 until he passed in uh, 1866, he devoted his life to healing the sick. And uh, he was, you want me to move this this way a little bit? Yeah. Dr. Quimby, as he was known, treated over 12,000 patients in his time. And among those were the dressers, uh, Warren Phelps Evans, and Mary Baker Eddy. And you guys recognize those folks, right? Now, his concept of mental healing, and he did, uh, he did physical healings from a mental perspective. So that, that I think was impressive because it just was. It was 150 years ago that this was going on. We just thought it only happened 2,000 years ago, right? So at any rate, uh, the concept behind mental healing was that if the misunderstanding that created the disease were exposed to wisdom, then the faulty thinking would be corrected and the disease healed. So in many respects, I'm going to say anything that improves our understanding of this life we are in can have healing results. So I, I know you've already blessed the sanctuary and I just want to do a, a little uh, a little thing that we used to do at Quimby Center all the time. And so I surround myself in this room and everyone in it with the pure white light of the Christ, so that only that which is good, perfect, and beneficial for us at this time may enter, Father, Mother, God, and all else must return from whence it came. And we are thusly protected. You can do that when you're driving, you can do it at your house, you can do it anywhere. So. I'm going to speak about reincarnation today, or maybe the paradigm of reincarnation and how you might use that in your life. And I went and researched a little bit because uh, I wanted to see what Unity's stand on reincarnation was. And it was said that Charles Fillmore believed that he was a reincarnation of the Apostle Paul. Well, I can't vouch one way or the other for that. but. Reincarnation is one of Unity's most distinctive doctrines. The Fillmore's borrowed heavily from the teachings of Swami Vinkanada from India. Vivekananda, okay, there we go. Uh, but sensing that the idea of tra soul transmigration back to animal form might not sell well with Westerners, they insisted that reincarnation could only occur in human bodies. It's purported that many new thoughters, including around exactly, I guess, 74% of its leaders believe in reincarnation. Ernest Holmes, who, uh, you know, CSL is an Ernest Holmes reader, as we are at Wellspring, says, I do not believe in the return of the soul to another life on this plane. The spiral of life is upward. Evolution carries us forward, not backward. And you can read that in the Science of Mind book, page 386. I say, everything I know indicates that we are always on an upward path, 
and that we don't reincarnate to lower life forms. Coming back to another Earth experience isn't necessarily going backwards. It could still be on an upward spiral. And then we have those who say, well, you know, I think uh, Ernest Holmes was said to say, well, I for myself don't plan on coming back. Well, I don't know where he was in his evolutionary process, but I would like to consider that there are probably highly evolved souls, if you will, that drop in for a visit. And it's not really a visit because they have a very specific job to do when they drop in. And they may not sort of follow the average or the normal reincarnation process. Or they may have already gone through a large number of lives and are a highly evolved being, and so they come back to provide service. And I say, you also, you don't have to believe in reincarnation to get something out of what I'm gonna to say today. So if you can just kind of, if, it, if it's not something that you're comfortable with, just take a deep breath, don't worry about it. <laughs> because you don't have to believe in reincarnation to achieve your destiny. Now we've got one of those, right? You do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, but it may help explain some things or provide some insight into your life. And no matter what you believe, I think you believe that you're here now and that you've got to deal with what and where you are at now. So, you know, all that other stuff doesn't particularly matter. But I think the paradigm of reincarnation can be useful in understanding where we're at today. So my, my introduction to New Thought was in the early 70s when I became associated with the Quimby Center in Alamogordo, New Mexico. And Quimby Center was started by uh, Dr. Nevidel Hunter. And she was a trans channel and she channeled uh, an entity who called himself uh, Dr. Gordon. And uh, Dr. Gordon's last incarnation, he was Quimby, and so therefore the name of the, the Quimby Center. And so as you introduced the beginning Sunday of this month uh, about spiritualism, I think that if I had to define myself, I sort of came into new thought as more of a spiritualist. And I didn't really learn to speak Ernest Holmes until around 2004 when I got involved with Wellspring. And they typically or did a lot of Ernest Holmes stuff. Uh, <clears throat> so, like I said, when I began to, excuse me. <clears throat> so I kind of had to recast what I knew and understood into Ernest Holmes talk to be more uh, maybe understandable, I don't think acceptable was really, that's too strong of a word because uh, we we're very accepting. But another thing, and this is kind of how it ties into today's talk, is that Dr. Hunter or Dr. Gordon did karmic life readings, and which I had done, and many, many of us, uh, that was part of our spiritual practice was to have a karmic life reading uh, discussion of our past lives if you will. And so Dr. Hunter would go into a trance and Dr. Gordon would come and he spoke from the fifth plane in the 17th chair and he, his voice changed. If you, any of you have been, been in trance uh, channel situations, uh, their voice seems to change and so forth. And uh, in addition to that, I think that the Sunday teachings, because uh, our Sunday teachings consisted of Dr. Hunter going into a trance and, and uh, giving Dr. Gordon uh, control over her vocal cords, and uh, we would have a, have a lesson. And it was kind of, there was an assumption, if you will, at least I don't remember anybody saying yay or nay, but there was this assumption that uh, we had lived previously and that we potentially might live again. But uh, so I just want to go over some of the things I learned because they're like a basic part of who I am and my philosophy and my approach to life and so forth. And I have to say that I didn't even know if these were true in the sense that could be validated by some external source. 
but it was such a part of my belief that I operated from, what the heck, it didn't matter. So for whatever reason, in the uh, last few years, I started reading a couple of books, and I thought, wow, this is really surprising. There's nothing that I'm reading here that disagrees with what I already assumed I knew. I thought that was pretty cool. And so one of the things that uh, kind of answered, answered one of the questions was, you know, the spirit that came through in the trance called himself Dr. Gordon. Well, why didn't he call himself Quimby? So uh, one of the books says that uh, many, the name that we go by on the inner planes is not necessarily one of those that we've used in an incarnation. We might have used it in an incarnation, but we don't have to have used that. So therefore, Dr. Gordon could have been, I don't even remember if he had a first name, but anyway. Uh, Dr. Gordon uh, could have been a name that uh, he'd used in one incarnation or not, it doesn't matter. But at any rate, Okay, there we go. So, uh, the first book of the series that here that I read was uh, Journey of Souls, uh, Michael Newton. And then I read Destiny of Souls. And then I read uh, Sylvia Brown's book, Life on the Other Side. And lastly, a friend gave me this one, uh, A Little Soul in the Sun. And I'll kind of touch on all of those. But, and then top left is a picture of Quimby. So uh, I guess I mentioned this, well, I mean, I'm going to talk about some, I'll call them facts. They may not be facts, but we'll put them. Here's kind of the things that I knew or understood about reincarnation and some of these that came through the uh, karmic readings and the uh, Sunday teachings and so forth. And uh, I guess one of the things I never heard was that we would uh, come back as a grasshopper or something like that. You know, so it was pretty easy for me to assume that uh, once you were human, if you were ever anything but human, uh, you know, you, you stayed human. But it seems that many of us began our Earth incarnations on the order of 70,000 years ago. And typically, we arrived here from another planet. And the various planets had their specialties and skills. And so if you came from the planet Saturn, you know, maybe you were involved in the, uh, the legal system or judgment or something like that. And if you came from the planet Mercury, that was known for their, uh, they uh, taught a lot of healers on the planet Mercury. So I don't remember all of them. Uh, and anyway, when we came to our series of Earth incarnations, then we brought those skills with us. And uh, typically, there's two to 300 years between births. It varies a little bit, but, uh, and there are some exceptions. I know some of you who have read about reincarnation, you know, you read about, uh, there was a young fellow who was a pilot in World War II, and he came back, it was able to go back to uh, his uh, childhood home and things like that. So obviously that was less than 300 years or 200 years. And uh, usually we've had fewer than seven lives since the time of Jesus. So, uh, so one of the things I want to kind of use that to uh, elucidate is that not everyone's at the same level. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, does every second grader, or does a, sec does a second grader have the same knowledge as a seventh grader? Or does every second grader have the same knowledge, the same understanding? No. So why does it, just everybody in this room should have the same understanding? Not really. Uh, maybe that will uh, help you understand why uh, when you tell your neighbor if you change your thinking, you change your life, they look at you like you're <laughs> foolish, right? <laughs> But there's some other things here. Uh, we came with a plan for each life. So 
So what I want to call this is intentional incarnation. After life, there's a life review. Um, we've heard about the last judgment, all that baloney. But uh, actually, that's I shouldn't call it baloney. I should call it a belief system. And we all know what the abbreviation for belief system is, right? <laughs> OK. But there is, if you think of it as a, a post-mission debriefing that's done <laughs> after each life, but this is done with great love and support, support by folks who have your best interest in mind. And then there's, uh, after this debriefing, there's time for rest, relaxation, uh, learning, and eventually begin to plan your next experience. And something I was taught that, uh, you know, we talk about karma and what is karma, and we always use that to beat each other up with, right? or to beat ourselves up with, probably that's the first uh, victim. But a karmic issue is created as a result of an unresolved conflict, or as a result of guilt, or a loss that we don't grieve and get over. So those might be some reasons for coming back, because we've got to learn a few more stuff, things. Or uh, maybe we well, you know, we need a little more growth, clearly. We have an interest in serving. Perhaps those who come back, there are some who, folks who come back that don't have a great, a great need to, you know, resolve too many things, but their, their job is to, to come and serve, help raise the consciousness of the rest of us. Uh, so I guess what I'm going to say, if, if you don't, you know, there are people who say, ah, I don't want to come back. Right? You know, nobody's ever said that in this room, I guess. But, you know, this life sucks. I don't want to come back. So I'm going to say this. If you don't want to come back, you better deal with your unresolved issues right now. So whether you believe in reincarnation or not, that's probably not a bad plan. So the, these topics are kind of intertwined. And if we think of this as a spiral or a circle or whatever, you've got life and you've got death and you've got pre-planning and, you know, it's, so where do you start? It's, uh, it's kind of a chicken or the egg kind of thing because we're trying to address this in a linear fashion, but I don't quite know where I want to start, right? But I think what I want to talk about today is life planning. And these two books, Journey of Souls and Destiny of Souls, well, actually, the Life on the Other Side uh, touches into it pretty well as well, is that these are results of research in life between lives, or the time we spend between lives. And uh, Michael Newton, rather than going into, oh, this is a cool story about somebody in the 17th century who was killed by pirates, or, you know, that kind of thing, he's like, okay, so now that you're here, <laughs> now that you're on the other side, what's going on? And so he documented that. And it's, I just think it's fascinating. Uh, and I just want to di digress a little bit. And I say, first of all, I've been using this word you a lot, right? I mean, it's me as well as you. But what, who is the you we're talking about? Is this your ego or your personal mind? Uh, no, we're talking about your soul. We're talking about that being that has all these experiences. I think uh, some people say we're spiritual beings having a human experience. So that's the you we're talking about. And if you bring yourself up to that level or out to that level or into that level, wherever that level is, the things that are happening here on this current physical plane is kind of just like a play or an act that we're in. So uh, a quote from Richard Bach and the adventures of a reluctant messiah. You are led through your lifetime by the inner learning creature, the playful spiritual being that is your real self. So, for, again, I, I don't want to try to convince you of anything, but there are some things that don't hang together. First of all, we talk about our soul being eternal. Right? Isn't that kind of a... Con 
Okay, so uh, if you're eternal, then you, this you I'm talking about, would have to exist before and after your current embodiment, would it not? Okay. Or is it just one of these one and done and, you know, the end of it, yeah. <laughs> So, if there is reincarnation, or maybe I'm only saying you have to believe in incarnation, I'm going to say perhaps then there is a pre-incarnation. Okay, so where were you before you were born? And some of this is uh, from Newton's research, and some of this is uh, what I learned years ago. And I want to talk about what happens right before birth, because this feeds into... not being a victim, believe it or not. So first of all, uh, you, your time for rest and relaxation is over and it's uh, gonna be time to, uh, to go to the next grade or however we wanna define that. So you meet with your spirit guides. And one of the things it said is, uh, do you get to plan your, you get to write the play and your spirit guides work with you. They say, yeah, okay, that's, uh, maybe that's a little tough, you know, trying to do those three things all at once, but okay, you know, let's kind of... And then we work out the details, and uh, we always get into this concern that uh, there's predestination, right? Oh, can't have that. Well, how many of you have planned a trip, you know, well, I know some of you might have gone to the spring break in Mexico or what have you, you know, and you got it all planned out, right? You know, at 4 o'clock we leave and da 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 and does the trip go exactly according to plan? No, no, yeah, it's okay. But the kinds of things that we plan, we plan our goals, and they can be broad and specific both. What lessons do we want to learn, and what contributions do we want to make? Okay, so some other things we get to choose is our parents and our social situation that we're born into. You can't, well maybe you can, I was going to say you can't learn about poverty if you were born into a, uh, a trust fund necessarily. I, I don't want to make that generalization. We also um, start lining up our friends or our partners or the relationships that we're going to have in that life or you can call them your support team. And uh, one of the things that your support team can do for you is to help you remember who you really are. Because you're gonna forget. And uh, we might pick somebody who's going to be our uh, teachers. That's not always pleasant. What if uh, you've, uh, contracted with somebody to help teach you forgiveness. Yeah, they could be a real sweet old boy. So that little soul in the sun uh, talks a little bit about that, and that's, that's kind of a nice, nice thing to put your, uh, uh, to maybe read to your grandkids, because it touches on that. And, uh, this also brings us to the concept of soul clusters or groups. And it was interesting, I was talking to somebody who uh, really lives their life by numerology, and they said, you know, I find that a lot of people that are in my life right now all have the same numerological uh, number, or numbers. I thought, oh, that's interesting. Hmm. So you might say, I find that a lot of people who are in my life right now are folks I've worked with before in previous incarnations. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it works. I better cover it up in case it starts doing things on its own. <laughs> All right. So this is a slide from uh, the Destiny of Souls book. And uh, this was some targeted research that uh, Michael Newton did about this uh, woman whose current name was Ruth. And the, the immediately, or the inner circle, 
are folks that are in her life right now. And you see she has a father, a mother, a uh, best female friend, a brother, daughter, husband, son, and sister. Okay. Now, if you, the idea is that you go out to the next step, and let's say you follow her mother in her previous incarnation. Her, mo her current mother was her grandmother then, and prior to that was an aunt. And her best female friend, that's at, you know, about 3 o'clock, or at uh, 1.30, was a sister and a mother. And a brother was a husband at one time and a son at another time. And her husband, that's at 6 o'clock, was the best male friend and uh, at a couple incarnations ago was a wife. Okay. Now, I think he, I don't remember exactly, but there was a situation where someone came into him to Newton for counseling. And what they were experiencing is that this was a woman, had a, a good friend, female friend, and whenever this female friend and her husband were talking, this woman felt a lot of jealousy. And she's like, why? My husband loves me, I love my, you know, this is all a cool situation. Why am I getting this? I mean, it's almost an uncontrollable thing. And so he did some research with her, and lo and behold, in a previous lifetime, her best friend and her current husband were married. And so she was picking up on that closeness. But at the same time, you know, all these people that are in your life now might have been in a, I mean, you can look at the options here, might have been very close in a previous incarnation. So I thought that was kind of, kind of cool, and he did, he did a good job of, of researching that. And so some other things that we do during this pre-incarnation is we set up uh, meeting signals with uh, folks that we want to meet. You know, so, okay, so uh, I'll be wearing a big red ribbon in my hair or, or whatever it is, you know. And, and so you're walking down the street and there's some woman with a big red ribbon in her hair and you go, that's kind of out of place, but got my attention and suddenly, you know, that thing goes that way. Uh, my feeling was that deja vu, as we used to call it in the 70s, right? I always said, you know, that just was a kind of an indication that I was on the right track. I was like, I've been here before. Oh, it's part of what I was planning, dude. Okay. Uh, and then we begin to associate with our new body and with our parents right before we're born. And this could be early on or late in the gestation period that we begin to associate with this body. If we arrive too early, uh, there's not much to work with, shall we say. If you arrive too late, you gotta figure out how to run the marionette pretty quickly. And there was somebody in one of the research says, yeah, well, Joey, you know, he arrived like 9.30, or at, uh, uh, I shouldn't say 9.30, uh, eight and a half months, and he's got a, got a lot of work to do on his first six months to learn how to operate this body. So I hadn't read that when I had this experience, and my kids are now in 30-ish. My wife at the time and I could not agree on my son's name. It didn't matter, it's this name, that name, it's no name at all. And finally, I think it was about eight and a half months, one or the other said Stephen, and the other one said that's exactly his name, and I said, wow. I'm wondering if that's what happened, you know. Now my daughter, we had no problem naming her. So in my paradigm, gee, my son wasn't quite committed or whatever, and we didn't know who was coming. But with my daughter, we did early on. Anyway, it's kind of fun. Uh, so this month, we talking, we're talking about gratitude. And I've got a quote here from Asha Tyson. Your journey has molded you for the greater good, and it was exactly what it needed to be. It took every situation you have experienced to bring you to now, and now is the right time. So, for my take on gratitude with respect to this talk, is that if you think of this as an interconnected spiritual system, which is all operating in a positive evolutionary direction, developed by you, but supported by God, 
How can you not feel grateful? I'd say God doesn't want you to fail. That's something to be grateful for. So, and we always talk about, well, look for the gift in the situation, right? Oh, yeah, so you like it when somebody tells you that when, you know, everything is full of... But with this perspective, how can you not be grateful to the person or the situation and mostly to yourself for this opportunity to gain soul experience? So there's nothing that isn't a gift. Everything is a gift, you know? I mean, you're in a play, you wrote it, you directed it, you act in it. But I don't always like it. <laughs> uh, so what I say about that is that uh, it's kind of hard to live in a victim mentality when you, when you take that approach to where you're at. And I'm grateful. So grateful. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Are we inspired or what? Yes. Yeah. Now get cozy in your chairs and comfy and, and we'll have some, take a little trip. Let's begin by taking in some deep breath all the way down into your lower diaphragm, filling your lungs. Take another one and another until you feel relaxed. Now as you Feel this energy around you, this loving, healing energy. Look down at your feet and notice the path in front of you, the path that you're standing upon. Notice that it leads you into the beautiful forest with trees that are turning, the leaves, autumn colors. And as you move forward, you can smell the earthiness of the forest You might feel the breeze, a little bit of a breeze, not too much, just perfect. Not cold, just right. And as you keep walking into this forest, pretty soon you see, see a bench right there next to the path. And if you choose, you can sit upon the bench or continue walking into the forest but as you continue, or as you're sitting, allow your mind and your heart to join and to feel, feel who you are. Feel who you are, the you that Edward spoke about, that eternal you, that happy, playful you, that you that is trying to talk to you. Just feel the breeze. You might hear some birds. And it causes you to think of this, that, or the other. And I'm gonna leave here, here for a moment as you allow, allow your communication Do you feel a sense of what you might be telling yourself? 
to slow down, to take it easier, to do something or not do something, to smile more, It might feel like an inner feeling in your solar plexus. You might have images or hear a tune in your, in your mind. A person or a place might come as a picture or a memory of a person reminding you of a thing, something that is important to you in the here and now. Now let's turn around if you're walking and let's walk back to that bench unless you're already there and let's relax there for just a moment. Let's heal some energy here. Let's feel that healing moving up your legs from your feet, the energy pooled around your feet, loving and healing you, moving up your legs and into your hips and up your spine through every center life, elimination, and through every center so that you feel this healing energy and you know that divine order takes place with this healing in every center, in every area of your being, not your, just your body, but your being. And knowing that this healing reaches out in every direction including time, past, present, future. And you feel the ignition, the loving healing energy taking its place, filling you with enthusiasm and zeal as it moves in throughout you, your entire being from the atom through the quantum soup all around you into this room and beyond into this city and beyond, encircling the globe, sharing your loving healing energy as a channel of the divine, this healing energy touching every need, healing every hurt. And we believe it because we feel it. We feel it right here in our solar plexus we know it in our heart and in our minds. And we bring this knowing, the certainty, back with us here in your sitting, in this room, where you're in their chair, feeling your hands and feet, where you are, right here. Amen. And so it is. So it is. Thank you.